So we're going to talk today a little bit about the human side of artificial intelligence. And um, there are a lot of directions that this topic could go um, from um, autonomous drones and robotic killers to um, intelli artificial intelligence uh, actually controlling us already. Um, and I want to touch on kind of all of those things. Um, uh, but uh, let's have the uh, let's just get introduced and um, see where we are. Okay, so uh, quite a cheerful uh, introduction to this topic. Um, but it just raises some important um, points that I think people um, are getting increasingly exercised about. But what I thought was most interesting was that this is not a new topic. Um, this is a topic that's been around for 40, maybe even 50 years. Um, for those of you who don't know that film, um, I, I love it because it's got teletypes in it and it's, uh, it's got a teletype in the background. Um, but it's called Colossus, the Forbin project. And the idea was that the United States gave over their control of their nuclear missile systems who could make uh, to a artificial intelligence computer called, in this case, Colossus. Um, and Colossus would autonomously make a decision as to whether to launch its weapons on Russia or anywhere else based on all available information and data um, and would bypass the delay uh, of getting the pres president's approval and the Joint Chiefs and all the rest of it. All very well in theory and as you can probably see there, um, the whole thing went disastrously wrong. Colossus found a, another computer that had been built um, using copied plans of Colossus in Russia called Guardian. Guardian and Colossus joined forces and then um, between them they put the whole world um, under their uh, control. Is that realistic? Um, so Elon Musk, who we'll see a little bit more later, um, has given us all 12 years before we are um, under the jackboot of the um, of the artificial intelligence um, uh, uh, domination um, and I sit here I sat here and uh, spent a day or so you know really thinking all this through reading a lot about this subject and my view is that we are not 12 years away from an artificial intelligence computer um, dominating the entire world um, I would think we're probably more like 40 or 50 years away from that being even a conceptual possibility um, that said it's quite clear that we are a lot closer to it than when it, we saw that Corbyn project uh, uh, film where it was purely a piece of imagination. Um, and now we're starting to see the introduction of artificial intelligence uh, in actually a deployable format. Now, the other funny thing about artificial intelligence is um, that you know everybody's going on about how intelligent it is. And obviously there was the Watson 
um, presentation, um, which uh, was made by IBM, and, and there they played the game Jeopardy. But the existential question of whether that's actually intelligence, whether that Watson computer had sentience, um, really hasn't been delved into um, anything like enough. Um, but, you know, it is definitely true to say that drones that are operating in the skies over, you know, the Middle East, making autonomous decisions about whether to launch their rockets, um, which may, um, you know, target not only terrorists, but it might also target civilians, or in fact, it might completely mistarget um, and fire before anyone has the opportunity to, to intervene. Um, you know, this does start to pose some really important questions. And actually what I see is a gap developing. Um, and there's a gap between business systems that support companies, um, where I think the artificial intelligence is frankly pretty weak um, and pretty unimpressive so far, and military intelligence, military AI, which I think, as in so many instances, is driving the um, the technology forward um, and seems to be far further ahead. The question is, you know, good, bad or the ugly, where do you think we're going to get to? Ugh. Current location of Commander LaForge. Cargo Bay 4. Data to Lieutenant Warp. Priority 1. Go ahead. Take Commander LaForge into custody immediately. Sir. That is an order. Okay, so um, that was obviously from the 1980s Star Trek TNG. I'm glad to say that I do um, share one attribute with Elon Musk, is that we're both terrible lifelong Trekkies. Um, but this, this particular example of artificial intelligence and its interaction with humans is quite interesting. Um, Data was a being that was created by a human, uh, fictionally called Dr. Noonien Sung. Um, he made another copy of data. Um, uh, his name escapes me actually for a minute. Isn't that awful? Somebody will put it on the chat in a sec. Uh, uh, and, oh, La, that was it. And um, uh, data is good and La is bad. And La was bad because he had emotions that he didn't have the maturity to handle. And data was supposedly good because he was had no emotion chip and therefore acted purely on logic and um, uh, uh, and, and uh, algorithmic decision making. Now, throughout the Star Trek series, Data wanted to become more human. Okay, well, off you go. Good, good luck with that. But the, the the thing that struck me was the number of times that Data was either overtaken um, by his programming or overtaken by a third party force, um, and therefore acted against the interests of the Star Trek Enterprise. And so how does that relate to today? Well, of course, today, what that means is that, you know, we already have cyber attacks on our systems. And if cyber attacks start happening on artificial intelligence systems, and we already don't fully understand how artificial intelligence develops its um, learning and, uh, and, and, and uh, 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 derives its decisions, um, the, uh, the fact that a third party could tip the algorithm or interfere with it is actually quite a terrifying prospect. And we already, you know, we already have that as a possibility. Um, so data taking over the enterprise, it always ends happily ever after Yahoo. Um, fantastic. Um, there was another very, very, very good episode, um, which was called The Measure of a Man, which was trying to decide whether as a sentient being, data had the right to life and the right to self-determination or whether he was the property of Star Trek. And that brings into, into effect um, all sorts of moral dilemmas about whether or not Data is a slave or whether he is a, um, you know, whether he's just a machine and whether a machine should have rights. And what we're seeing now, again, you know, this extends so far beyond just the little realm of, you know, IT, um, you know, what laws should be made um, so a great example, if an um, autonomous vehicle, let's say a Tesla, crashes and kills a mother and baby on the zebra crossing, because the zebra crossing is covered in snow and the Tesla can't see it, who is culpable? Because the car is driving autonomously, the driver is in 
the car, but not in control of the car. In fact, in future, you might have the car taking the children to school and there is no driver. So who is carpool? Is it the car manufacturer? Is it a general insurance fund? You know, is it the children? Uh, you know, and, and this is going to create a huge number of legal dilemmas. Now, the thing that Elon Musk said, and, and there is a truism behind this, and it's really, really interesting as well, is around um, the like the introduction of this technology and the likely consequences. So when we were in the 19th century, we were introducing trains everywhere. Now, the death rate on trains when they first started coming out was absolutely horrifying. The tank, tanks and boilers used to explode. They had no regula regulator to um, avoid an overpressure situation. The signaling was absolutely woeful. Um, you frequently got two trains on the same track that came crashing into each other. And the statistics for the dead in um, the early life of steam um, you know, would have would have made your heart sink far, far, far more, um, you know, uh, 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 dead than I think would be publicly acceptable, even though as a percentage of the population, we now kill more people on the roads every year um, than we do on the trains every decade. So, um, you, you know, some of this is more, you know, perception and statistics I'd, I'd accept. Um, but Elon said, when we introduce autonomous driving cars, and particularly while those cars are having to interact with human self-drivers, and human self-drivers are more likely to act unpredictably, he expects there to be a rise in death rates, and he expects there to be a rise in casualties and accidents. And I thought that was very interesting. And um, in fact, there's a great book um, about the battle between Westinghouse and Edison about whether it should be AC or DC electricity. And over the centuries, um, our human tolerance of death has declined significantly. Um, so now our expectation is that we don't die. We can prolong our lives for as long as is reasonable for a human lifespan to be. So, you know, 80 years. And if there's a new product or a new drug or a new chemical, that comes out that prolongs our life, we expect to be offered it and we expect to um, the, that chemical to extend our lifespans. And, you know, let's not even get into a quality of life debate. You know, that's where we are. And in fact, so all through this COVID crisis, which, should, you know, I, I characterize as a bit of pneumonia and a bit of um, a, a flu, um, you know, we have been closing the entire world down to try to prevent death. And so our tolerance of death has has, has been um, programmed into us that death is not inevitable and that we should fight death when we see it. And that's part of our natural survival instinct and we built our infrastructure around it. Um, when autonomous vehicles and artificial intelligence, if Elon Musk's prediction is true, uh, starts happening, then it'll be very interesting to see how far autonomous vehicles and similar technologies are allowed to go um, uh, before governments get scared um, and pull the and pull the uh, pull the reins on them, you know. And and let's be honest, there are um, people who have ambitions, and those ambitions extend um, to creating datas. Yes. Stop. Stop. Ava, I said stop. Whoa, 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 whoa. So this clip's interesting as well. Oh, there we go. Mute it, but I don't need it. So this clip's interesting as well. Um, the, this is Ex Machina, and the backstory to this is that um, a Mark Zuckerberger type who has um, an almost autistic Elon Musk-style desire to create an artificial human um, locks himself away um, 
and um, uh, builds uh, a, a intelligent, um, supposedly self sentient um, uh, android or robot that um, he is then using to test um, the um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the the whether or not that interaction any interaction by someone who didn't know what she was would pass as human um which was one of the tests that alan turing um set uh way back in the 40s um when he was uh uh doing his um doing his stuff for um gchq in manchester university and what have you in world war ii now uh this was also quite interesting and um he owned a facebook style social media platform and it had millions and millions of interactions emotions responses that he was using that feed anonymized data in order to inform this robot about appropriate responses to particular inputs or stimuli um, and therefore the robot through these interactions became um i suppose you'd call it self-aware but more than that it just started to develop the same kind of reactions that that, that kind of broad large-scale data it, database would tend to lend color to the problem that he had was that um this, this robot um clearly couldn't be trusted and therefore was in a small prison and uh, as with previous generations of these robots, robots was never ever going to be let out. Uh, not at least not until um, this guy was satisfied um, that the robot was still controllable. But there's the rub, right? How do you control an artificial intelligence robot that you're telling to be autonomous and sentient? I mean, you can't control a child. You know, we can control a child, but only by the force of your own authority and personality. In this instance, you know, clearly there is a very large disconnect um, between the behavior that he wanted to imbue on that robot and the behavior it's actually exhibiting. Um, so this, again, demonstrates very, uh, you know, there's a big danger here um, in human interaction um, uh, between humans and AI and the consequences of that could be as unimportant as a wrong bill or a wrong phone sent through the post or it could be as disastrous as of course this now again i'm pretty certain that everybody's going to know what this is um Terminator Two, I think this was from. Um, that's rubbish, isn't it? Because I actually downloaded the clip. I can't remember which little version of Terminator it was. Um, but there you go, Arnold Schwarzenegger um, and his um, uh, uh, his uh, skeleton, um, metallic skeleton. Um, is this possible? And actually, you know, this has now started to become a recurring question. Um, we had it not only in the terminator series of videos we've had it in the matrix uh you know we've had it in irobot um and so um whilst we are whilst we are de de developing and um uh creating fiction out of our fears for what this stuff could do we're not actually so far at least demonstrably demonstrating any solutions and that, of course, is, um, you know, quite dangerous. We are proceeding at a pace, developing aut autonomous drones and, 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 and. But as far as I know, those autonomous drones have not been programmed with the three laws. Oh, do you want to? Oh, God. Now, um, this is very interesting. And I think this was um, uh, quite insightful this little clip not because um it, it it has answers to those questions but more because it shows how the the computer can learn and it can learn to do things very quickly but um whether that it's learning to do a mechanical set of actions now whilst it's making decisions 
um, you know, how would you apply this to the real world? Um, and and what use would it be? Um, let's play the clip and see what you think. Ah, oh, you damn thing. Right, let's play the clip and see what happens. This is from the Define Reinforcement Learning System. Basically, it wakes up uh, like a newborn baby and is shown the screen of an Atari video game and then has to learn to play the video game. It knows nothing about objects, about motion, about time. It only knows that there's an image on the screen and there's a score. So if your baby woke up the day it was born and by late afternoon was playing 40 different Atari video games at a superhuman level, you would be terrified. You would say, my baby is possessed, send it back. The Defiant system can win at any game. It can already beat all the original Atari games. It is superhuman. It plays the games at super speed in less than a minute. So, um, but we get to the end of my um, little um, little kind of speech here. Um, we'll we'll discuss this. You know, how does that ability to play games that my four year old daughter can play, albeit not at super speeds? Um, uh, and at a computer AI's ability to play the same game in under a minute, uh, you know, what is what are the implications of that? Because whilst it's interesting, it's it's kind of difficult to see how those things link together. And whilst my daughter, you know, spent 10 minutes working out how to play the game, um, she also has spent four years learning how to um, speak, learning how to uh, move her arms, learning how to pick things up, learning how to, um, you know, write numbers, learning how to write letters, learn, learning how to create sentences. So, you know, my daughter is learning across multiple dimensions all at the same time. And this stuff happens to be part of the process at which she has come to uh, get excited um, about uh, the, uh, a video game. We have an arcade game downstairs um, in the playroom, in the den. Um, and so, I when I saw that, I funnily enough, I was less impressed than I think everybody else was would would have been, um, because yes, it could do it at super speed, but it's not doing something that we can't do at the moment. Okay, you can do it faster, but we can do it, and actually from quite a young age. Um, the question is whether it can do more than that. You know, whether it could preempt, whether it could do that game and preempt it, and actually stop any of the missiles actually being launched. When they're coming down from the sky now that would be interesting but we're, I, we're, we're miles away from that at the moment do you want to know what it is the matrix is everywhere it is all around us even now in this very room you can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television you can feel it when you go to work when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch, a prison for your mind. <sighs> Unfortunately, no one can be told what the matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to be. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Okay. Now, um, question for the chat. Does anybody remember what color of pill um, 
Neo took. Um, actually, I don't. I, just, uh, uh, I, I had the answer to this and I thought I'd written it down and I forgot. So, um, so uh, somebody might want to just look that up. Um, but um, this is an interesting concept. And again, this is, idea has been around for a few years now. The Matrix, I think the first um, edition, uh, the first film was actually back in 1999 or 2000 or something like that. Um, but this goes one step further. This says that we aren't going to have to be concerned about the development of AI. This says we're already part of AI. And in fact, we as ourselves are nothing part of nothing other than a massive planet-wide computer simulation. And Elon's rationale for that is that if we can develop AI to the point that we can create a sentient, conscious, independent entity, then it follows that somebody, other species, would have done it before us, and therefore we may all be just you know 25 lines of code in a massive um a computer program or whatever it is you know and uh, and our dna is effectively our uh not our what's the makes up ourselves but just what makes up our program um now that gets you into a whole load of other problems i mean first of all you, how can you prove it the only way you'd be able to prove it is if you could prove that not all of the laws of physics were actually consistent and actually held together. Um, and various scientists and, and, and um, PhD, you know, prove one minute that the law of gravity is inconsistent here. And then somebody else comes along and says, oh, but if you do this and multiply that equation with this one, yes, it is again. And everybody breathes a sigh of relief. Um, but what would we do if we found that actually there was a fundamental inconsistency in the way that the universe operates that makes us realize that we can't be anything other than just, you know, parts of a computer program. Now, I've just decided to pick this pen up and then I've decided to drop it. Now, probably in the entire universe, that dropping of a pen, irrespective of the butterfly effect, has made no difference to anyone or anything anywhere ever in the entire world, universe, or anything else. But you know, when I did that, when I picked this pen up and I dropped it, did I do that because I just it momentarily decided um, that that is a good idea and that um, you'd all be really excited and see me drop my pen? Or was that already programmed in millennia ago that uh, 1834 on the 10th of February 2022 in Maidenhead, just outside of London, um, some idiot talking about AI would drop his pen. Um, if we do take the latter as the assumption, then we are by definition saying that we don't have free will. Um, we don't have autonomous decision making. All we are doing is responding to a, pre a program that has um, pre a set of predefined inputs and outputs and that we are merely uh, executing those instructions in that program and that then moves you on so well if there's some axe murderer out there and he was pre-programmed and he had no free will then is he really a murderer is he really a psychotic or is he actually just a victim of the programming that that particular code branch took him down and therefore should he be in prison for 50 years or actually you know it it, it, it was it uh, a an inevitability that that was going to always happen. So you get into very dark philosophical places very quickly when you start to bend your head around this stuff, um, and it all gets very complex and 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 very difficult um, to start to unpick. Because if one company or small group of people manages to develop godlike digital super intelligence, they can take over the world. At least when there's an evil dictator, that human is going to die. But for an AI, there would be no death. It would live forever. And then you'd have an immortal dictator from which we can never escape. Um, now, I think Elon is right. And I um, also think, however, that he is wrong when he says we could have an immortal dictator. 
in my view, we already have a an immortal dictator, and that's called the IRS or HMRC, the tax man in the UK. They are the immortal dictators that force us to work and force us to um, to um, pay for pay for our, our our infrastructure and what have you. And wouldn't we all just be much happier off um, if we lived in a little cave on our own um, and went out with our bow and arrows? And well. That's where Russia and Ukraine leaves us, but maybe we might be doing that in about the next six or eight weeks or so. Who knows? <coughs> so back in April, we did our first live test. Sorry, that's I meant to. I didn't mean to uh, for that to go <laughs> quite as quickly. So we've covered quite a lot of ground, and I've been covering some quite existential issues around AI and how humans interact with it, and. You know, hopefully that's provoked some thinking in you. Some of it you've probably already heard. Um, maybe some of it you haven't. And you might, you know, go home to the wife or husband or partner tonight and, you know, have it as a dinner topic. But, you know, for us as consultants in the ERP and digital transformation world, um, it's a bit or MEH. I mean, so what? Yeah, very interesting. Yada, yada, yada. A robot might kill us well fine then we're not going to worry about it because we'll be dead so i wanted to bring this back in a last couple of minutes to where we are with business with this kind of digital technology um and um i think what you will see is an absolutely ginormous gap between all the things that we've discussed so far and um you know, where companies are in terms of exploiting uh, digital technologies and AI in particular. Now, I've used Vodafone as an example uh, of this um, because I have a current pathological hatred for Vodafone um, because they cut my phone off um, for no good reason because their billing systems don't work. And I blame Phil Goss personally for this. And I've actually sent him an, a message and Scott. Uh, messages personally saying so. Um, so I'm using Vodafone as the example um, yeah, purely because I don't like them at the moment. Next year, if I don't fight some other company, I'll use them as the example, but we'll worry about that nearer the time. This is a example of a piece of digital technology being deployed and Vodafone are very excited about it. Let's have a look, shall we? Oh, this isn't the right one. Apologies, this one. Back in April, we did our first live test 5G call. Today, I'd like to build on that to show you what we can really achieve. Today, we're going to be calling somebody really special in our Manchester base. This call is going to be the UK's first holographic call live using 5G. So super exciting. Joining us is Manchester City and England football captain, Steph Houghton. Hello, Steph. Hello, are you okay? Hey, it's great to be able to see you. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. I'm overwhelmed that I can see you. Absolutely amazing. Iris has travelled all the way from London today. She's a massive Manchester City and England football fan. Hi, Iris. Hello. Hello, Iris. How are you? It must be amazing to be a captain. What skills do you think it requires? First and foremost, you've got to work hard, but also be there for your teammates, both on and off the pitch. I hope everyone in the room can see the power of our emerging technology and some of the fantastic experiences we can create. Thank you. OK, well, I, um, I sat there um, and I have to be perfectly honest with you. I was super unexcited by that whole thing. Um, that doesn't strike me as being terribly useful, a bit of a gimmick, um, but there we go. Um, you can make your own decisions on that. Um, uh, and I put that really in just as an example of technology, which is a solution looking for a problem. And it'll be useful when you don't have to wear stupid headsets and have um, eight sets of digital cameras around you in a circle. Um, uh, so you have to go into some very highly specialized television studio with enormous bandwidth um, in order to, 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 to generate the 360 degree images. Um, so I'm like, yeah, so what? Right, load of nonsense, move on. The next thing is more interesting, and I, I'm going to pull this one to pieces as well. But I think you'll, 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 you'll get a, a, a good idea of, of what I'm talking about. 
At Vodafone, we want to deliver outstanding customer service. Yeah, Phil. Every year you receive around about 15 million calls from general billing inquiries to technical issues with the device or home broadband queries. Obviously, that's a huge number for us and we want to reduce that down. By using Intelligent Care, we're able to do that quickly and seamlessly with great customer SAT results. Intelligent Care works out which customers are going to call and then proactively reaches out to those customers with all the information they need. That often means that they don't have to contact us, but when they do, they'll be steered to the best possible channel. So, um, well, the, you're very cheerful, Phil, and if I'd given all that money to Accenture, um, I would, as a client partner, I'd be very cheerful. Um, and so let's talk about that practically. So um, my phone got cut off. Uh, there was an orphaned bill. Um, um, and um, uh, the, the result of that orphaned bill uh, was that, um, uh, as I said, my phone got cut off for three days. I couldn't call anyone. Um, but I couldn't pay the bill because there's nowhere nowhere to pay. I couldn't through, pay it through the portal. I couldn't pay it through the um, automated payment solution. Um, and um, uh, so uh, it, it, and customer services um, uh, initially, when I did manage to get through to them, um, and I'll tell you about that in a second, um, couldn't find any outstanding balance any, either, but they couldn't reinstate the call. Now, they couldn't. Uh, the, the, the difficulty uh, I had in actually speaking to anyone was enormous um, because whenever I called customer service, customer care, I got to a point at where I had um, um, managed to say I've got a bill problem, but it would not put me through to a human being. It would put me through to the automated payment solution because it saw that I had an outstanding bill and thought I wanted to pay it. Um, you can't pay a zero bill balance in the UK. The banks don't allow zero balance bills um, for whatever reason. Um, if you had a penny or 30 pence or something, that would be fine, but zero is not allowed. So consequently, I could not get any further. And I can. You, we will probably see, as this is the second time through the stratosphere I've referenced it, I'm so absolutely fuming with rage and frustration at how crap they are. But let's go back a step. You know, they get 15 million calls and they want to reduce the number of calls by proactively reaching out to customers, sending the information they need in advance of them calling in. Well, I obviously can assure you that I didn't get the information I needed either before or after I called them. So clearly, whatever intelligent care cost them didn't work for me. But the other thing is, you know, they've spent millions on a solution solving a problem that is a symptom of um, their uh, hopelessness in their IT rather than the core of the problem. You know, they're getting 15 million calls, and I would accept that, you know, out of those 15, probably 10 million are, how do I turn my phone on? How do I turn my phone off? How do I forward a call? And you're right, he's right to say all of those can go, they can be diverted off, um, and that's absolutely fine. But for those 5 million that are left, um, you know, uh, a significant number of those I know, and I know this because I worked in O2 and T-Mobile, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm very telco aware, are billing problems. Billing is a nightmare. And in Vodafone in particular, Accenture put in a SAP system, I think it was, um, about 2013. <gasps> no, 2016. Yeah, so about uh, eight years ago. and um it, it was a absolute horrible 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 nightmare but the same problems this is the second time i've upgraded my phone and i've had the same problem um and i'm not the only one i know that um so they haven't resolved the core issue they're reducing their call center volumes by diverting people who are already satisfied away from their call center but they're not investing their money in actually fixing their ERP systems, which are basically a load of rubbish. All they're doing is trying to put more and more and more layers around them, like their utterly dumb, unintelligent IVR, that 
if you say billing, it doesn't matter what you say afterwards, you can say billing disestablishmentarianism and it will still take you to the automated payment solution. Um, so um, my um, criticism of Vodafone in this instance and my criticism of many companies similar is that they are using this technology to mask core problems in their company. They're not using it to actually drive change um, for the benefit of the customer. And so when we talk about this stuff and, you know, 5G, wow, woohoo, we're talking about intelligent care. Fantastic. OK, the call that I was going to make to you to get some information I haven't had to make to you because you've sent it to me already. You know, OK, that, thank you very much. That's so kind of you. The call that I can't make because their systems, once you need to talk to them, are so stupid and unintelligent, you can't actually get through to speak to anyone. And then when you do speak to what, there someone, their ERP and te surrounding technologies are so unfit for purpose that even customer services can't tell you why the bill, has, as a, a zero bill, has ended up in you being cut off, I think is simply unacceptable. And actually, in, in the... Uh, note that I sent to uh, Phil and Scott um, uh, at, down at Newbury, um, and I actually was going to go down there because it's only about 20 minutes away from where I live. So I was going to go down, down to their global HQ and sit outside with a notice on the top of my car saying, Phil and Scott, please come here. I'd like to talk to you. Um, uh, I, it's, uh, it's shameful. It, it's shameful that we are in 2022 and we still have horrible, horrible SAP, horrible configurations impeding business. And it should not be like that. And if all of the money that we were investing now in exciting artificial intelligence and whoopie do 5G, we were actually investing in making an SAP solution that actually worked or an Oracle one or any one of these others that, uh, you know, so frequently end up on the in the waste bin, you know, our world would be more productive, it would be happier. But putting an intelligent care system in that just tries to mask over the problems, in my view, is is um, not moving us any further forward. And so um, that for me is just very, very disappointing. Um, so as uh, you know, we're all going to get killed by the artificial intelligence drones shortly anyway, I can't get that excited about it, um, but you know, for the time being, um, uh, you know, we just live with what we have. So, um, most of most of you will recognise these. These are the three laws. Um, Isaac Asimov. And for, there's two thoughts to this. Number one, um, this all sounds great, um, fantastic. How have those three laws been built into the operating systems of military autonomous drones at the moment? Well, let's just get cut straight to the quick. They haven't. And even if they were in the future, how long would it be before a terrorist or a hacker or a foreign government hacked into that code base and actually maybe, you know, fiddled about with one of those laws and made it actually kill everyone who hadn't had hadn't threatened it. Um, and as I said, you know, the the technology frequently outpaces the fra political framework or the 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 um, human architecture that's needed to control it. And you saw this with the bomb in 1945. Um, they developed the bomb and then they had to develop a load of protocols in order to know how to manage that. And what we ended up with was mad, right? Mutually assured destruction. And that really didn't satisfy anyone particularly. And you know, now we're getting back to a situation where that where that danger is again. 